Recording in progress. Om Ajnana Timarandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chaksur Militanyena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishtaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swaminiti Namane Namaste Sarasati Devi Gauravani Precharine Nirvishesha Shanyavadi Paschacha de Shatarine Vanchakaupata Rubyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha Paditanam Pavane Bio Vaishnavibio Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Hatvaita Gadadhar Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So welcome everyone to our Bhakti Vaibhav study of the second canto and today we're going to go on to chapter number three. So, before we go on to chapter num number three, would someone like to tell me something they remember from yesterday's class? Thank you so much. Yes? Yesterday we saw the connection between uh, the chapter one and two. The chapter one talks about the universal form, and chapter two talks about the meditation of the Paramatma form. And uh, this is progressively uh, understanding the Brahman, Paramatma and Bhagavan aspects, so, which we are going to learn further. <clears throat> okay. And also we saw that how the, uh, uh, the yogis, they have to travel to various planets and undergo various purification. And uh, after a long time, uh, with a lot of struggle, then finally they, if, if they continue the process, they may reach to the Supreme Law. And we also saw that uh, there are three categories of people who go to the uh, uh, higher abode, 70 planets, either through karma or jnana, or the, but the devotees, they directly go to the Supreme Lord through the books of devotional service. Uh -huh. Yeah, we were talking particularly about at the time of death because it's in relation to Maharaj Parikshit. Remember, Maharaj Parikshit is preparing for death. So Sukadeva Goswami was describing about yogis, how they leave the body and how they elevate themselves, how they can elevate themselves up to these higher planets. And particularly at Satya Loka, it was described three different kinds of perfection were there from Satya Loka. Okay, so we'll go ahead to chapter number three. Are you okay there? Have you got the PowerPoint? Is it visible? Yes, yes Maharaj. Okay. Oh. What's this? <laughs> What's going on? Okay, chapter number three, pure devotional service, a change in heart. So the first nine chapters are going to describe about demigod worship. Actually, I'll just read the first verse. Sukadeva Goswami said, Maharaj Parikshit, as you have inquired from me as to the duty of the intelligent man who's on the threshold of death, so I have answered you. Right? So, Sukadeva Goswami is described about these yogis and about particularly about at the time of death that we, we do want to hear and chant. We want to be able to hear and chant the glories of the Lord. 
So now Sukadeva Goswami is going to go on and describe about uh, different, first of all he will mention about demigod worship. Why? Because somebody at the time of death, they may have material desires. So what about people who have material desires? Even at the time of death, people can have, the, they have these material desires. And so, Sukadeva Goswami describes, first of all, he said, this is reading from the verse, text number two, one who desires to be absorbed in the impersonal Brahma Jyoti effulgence should worship the master of the Vedas, Lord Brahma or Brihaspati, the learned priest. And then he, he goes on to describe more, uh, more, much more materialistic gross desires. One who desires powerful sex should worship the heavenly king, Indra. One who desires good progeny should worship the great progenitors called the Prajapatis. And so like this he goes on and goes, he gives us a list, a whole list of different demigods, Durga Devi and then uh, the Vasus and Rudra. And one who wants to worship, may want to have a lot of grains, you can worship a deity. You want to go to the heavenly planets, worship the sons of the Aditi. You want a worldly kingdom, you can worship Vishvadeva. And you may want to be a king, you can worship Manu. And like this, there's so many different demigods are described. And you want to be beautiful, worship the Gandharvas. You want a good wife, worship the Apsaras. <laughs> so many different desires are discussed. And then at the end of it, he said, uh, Oh, wait, I have to go on. <laughs> the next verse, text number eight, describes. One should worship Lord Vishnu or his devotees for spiritual advancement in knowledge and for protection of heredity and advancement of a dynasty, worship the various demigods. All right, so it was mentioned, worship Lord Vishnu, and but then text number nine mentions that it, one who, uh, one who at the end of text number nine, one who desires nothing of material enjoyment should worship the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So it's mentioned there uh, at the end of the verse, Akama Purusham Puram, Param, Akama Purusham Param. If you have no material desires, then you can worship the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So all of these different demigod worshippers, they're all described as less intelligent. From the Bhagavad Gita, we know in Lord Krishna's opinion, all of these people who are worshipping demigods to get material things, they're all less intelligent and they're worshipping in the wrong way. And whatever benedictions they get from these demigods can only be given by the grace of Krishna. So that is uh, the statement given there, text number 9. And then text number 10, which is the significant verse, describing worshipping Krishna, the ultimate path. Text number 10, the famous verse, which is often quoted, which I think you will all know, right? Akama sarva kamo va moksha kamo daradi tivrena bhakti yogena yajeta purusham param. Right? If one has all a person, a person who has 
broader intelligence, right? Udharadi, mm. akama sarva kama va moksha kama udharadi, uh, udharadi meaning broader intelligence. Other people, these demigod worshippers, they're not udharadi. They're not. They don't have very broad intelligence. They have aupameda saha. Hmm? Antavat tu palam tesham tad bhavati shaham. Their intelligence is aupa, very meager. And when Prabhupada, I heard Prabhupada was describing, he said their brain is like stool because they simply desire material things. So aupa medasaha. They don't have broader intelligence, they're foolish. They're worshipping for things which are limited and temporary. So demigod worship is condemned in the Bhagavad Gita by Lord Krishna. And here Sukadeva Goswami is describing, you know, okay, you have material desires, you, but then he mentions at the end of all the, that list of demigods, he says, uh, a person who is intelligent, who has a broader intelligence, whether he be full of all material desire, or without any material desire, or desiring liberation, must by all means worship the Supreme Whole, the Personality of Godhead. So this is the conclusive statement here of Sukadeva Goswami that you don't need to worship all these other demigods. You simply worship the Supreme Lord. It doesn't matter you have material desires or whatever desire you want. You want liberation, okay, then still you worship the Supreme Lord. And you have no desires, then you still have to worship the Lord. It's also required. So this is the position. We have to understand how to properly fulfill our desires. Okay, so text number 10, very important. Tivrina Bhagavatam. You'll remember also it's in Srimad Bhagavatam it describes Sumedha Saha, right? We have Aupameda Saha in the Bhagavad Gita and Sumedha Saha. Where do you find that word, Sumedha Saha? You know the verse? Krishna Vandam Tushan Krishna. Yes, right, good. Yes, in the eleventh canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, where Lord Chaitanya is predicted, so it's described how Lord Chaitanya and the devotees who are taking part in the Sankirtan movement, then they have the purified intelligence, Sumedha Saha. So Udharadi is mentioned in this ninth verse, and the broader intelligence. We understand. Worship the Supreme Lord. Text number 10. Oh, oh, did we, we covered 10. That was 10. Text number 11 then says, uh, All the different kinds of worshippers of multi-demigods can attain the highest perfectional benediction, which is spontane spontaneous attraction unflinchingly fixed upon the Supreme Personality of Godhead only by the association of the pure devotee of the Lord. So spontaneous attraction to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. We would all like to have that. Different kinds of worshippers can get the ultimate benediction, the highest benediction which is to be fixed on the Personality of Godhead. And we get that by association of the pure devotees of the Lord. So we do need association. Association is vital for us. And we want to get the best possible association, association of the pure devotees. And then, after describing like this, then, text number 12 goes on, transcendental knowledge in relation with the Supreme Lord Hari is knowledge resulting in the complete suspension of the waves 
and whirlpools of the material modes. Such knowledge is self-satisfying due to its being free from material attachment and being transcendental, it is approved by authorities who could fail to be attracted. So, transcendental knowledge is being stressed here. And in order to actually appreciate transcendental knowledge, we have to get free from the material energy. So Sukadeva Goswami glorifies transcendental knowledge, explaining how it's self-satisfying, free from material attachment, transcendental, approved. So this is the second section here of the chapter. And after describing that, then we will hear Shona Karishi and his eagerness to hear Krishna Kata. So Shona Karishi, remember, he's the, the leader of the sages in Naimisharanya, and he's the one, he's the spokesman on behalf of all the sages. How many thousands of sages are there in Naimisharanya? Anyone remember? There's 60,000. Well, oh, I can't remember exactly myself. <laughs> I don't think it was 60,000, but anyway, it was a good, there were many people, there was thousands, yeah, it was thousands. So, Sona Karishi, he's very eager to, to hear Krishna Kata. And when Sona Karishi speaks, it's really powerful. You can really feel, wow, you know, this guy is really, he's really powerful. He really cuts through the ice. So he begins with some inquiry. 13 to 16 is an inquiry. And then at the end also he has an inquiry. Takes 25. But for, after his inquiry, then 17 to 20, you have Sonakariti's criticisms. He criticizes those who don't hear Krishna Kata. And then he goes on in text 20 to 24 to condemn the limbs and other bodily parts of those who do not serve Krishna. So we're going to look at these things today. This is the third chapter. This is the summary of the third chapter. So first of all, connection with chapter 2. Sukadeva Goswami concluded his answer to Parikshit Maharaj regarding the duty of a man about to die. A thoughtful person should hear Krishna Kata. A thoughtful person, right, Manisina? He's thoughtful. You should be thoughtful. The people who don't think then they won't, they won't be interested to hear Krishna Kata. But people who think, who have questions, they want to know what's, hap what's going to happen, what's, what, what's going to happen at the time of death, where should I go, what should I do? Thoughtful people who have questions, who inquire, these are the people, they want to hear Krishna Kata. But what about someone who has material desires? Whom should that person worship to fulfill these desires, those desires? As a prelude to his answer, Sri Sukadeva Goswami starts listing the personalities one may worship in order to fulfill one's material desires. And we do see a lot of worship like that, right? Many people, they worship Lakshmi, they want wealth, right? Somebody else, who, someone's worshipping Saraswati. They want to pass their exam, or maybe they're in acting or dancing. They worship Saraswati, the goddess Saraswati, the goddess of learning. And someone else may worship... Uh, the Ashwini Kumars, they want to have a long life, we heard today. 
or you may worship the sun god. Maybe you have health problem, you can worship the sun. People often worship Lord Ganesh. Ganesh worship is popular. Why? They have obstacles, problems in life, to overcome the problems. So, we see in the Brahma Samhita how different demigods are discussed. They're all mentioned one after another in the Brahma Samhita. You have, for example, Lord Ganesh, he's described that he gets his power to destroy obstacles because he holds the lotus feet of Lord Vishnu on his, on his two tumul tumuli. So as devotees, we don't worship Lord Ganesh to destroy obstacles. If we have some problem, serious danger or something, we can worship Lord Nisringadev. But a devotee who surrendered to Krishna, he knows that only Krishna can protect him. He simply takes shelter of Lord Krishna. And we want wealth, somebody may want wealth. Well, Lakshmi is the consort of Lord Narayan. Lakshmi is chancho, she's restless, she doesn't stay in one place. Why should you worship Lakshmi? She's going to leave you. But if you worship Lord Narayan, or who is non different from Lord Krishna, then Lakshmi, will, she always stays there. Although she's chancho, she's very chaste to Lord Narayan. And she resides permanently on the chest of the Lord. So in Brahma Samhita you see uh, Ganesh is mentioned, uh, Agni is mentioned, uh, then the, this, the, the sun god is mentioned, and then Brahma is mentioned, and Shiva is mentioned. They're all mentioned one, uh, there in the Brahma Samhita. But the conclusion is, Lord Brahma, who is speaking the Brahma Samhita, his conclusion is Govindam Adipursham Tamaham Bajami. It is Govinda who is the Supreme Lord. And all of these different demigods, whatever benedictions they can give, it's simply by the grace of the Supreme Lord, Govinda. So, whatever Bhagavad Gita also says, whatever a man may offer to other gods is actually meant for me alone but it's offered without true understanding. Okay, going ahead. Here we see fulfilling all desires. Sukadeva Goswami, as I have, as you have inquired from me as to the duty of the intelligent man, so, oh, the intelligent man who's on the threshold of death, so I have answered you. So it's mentioned there, Manushyeshu Manishinam. Manishinam, meaning thoughtful. So the thoughtful person, they will inquire about these things. Then text number 10, this famous verse, Akama. Sarvakamu. Moksha. Oh, my font is wrong here. I don't know why. I have to check that. Sorry. I didn't up, I didn't check the fonts on this one. Anyway, Akama Sarvakamu Va Moksha Kama Udaridi Tivrena Bhakti Yogena Yajeta Purusham Param. Akama no material desires. Sarvakama, all material desires. Moksha kama is also a desire. It's not desirelessness, right? Moksha kama, you have a desire. Udharadi, Udharadi, broader intelligence. And Tivrena Bhakti Yogena. Tivrena means very forceful worship of the Lord. Tivrena. Powerful worship, very focused on Bhakti Yogena, then they should worship the Supreme Lord. This is by those who are intelligent, the wise choice we've put there. Text number 11. 
of text number 11, we discuss how to develop broader intelligence. Right? How to develop? You have to worship the Supreme Lord. We don't worship the demigods. You won't become intelligent. We'll become less intelligent. Worship the Supreme Lord. That, and then also get the mercy of the devotee. We need to get that mercy of the devotee. That's very important for us. Text number 12 establishes the position of bhakti beyond liberation. Liberation is not important for a devotee. A devotee is not concerned with liberation because we know devotional service begins from the liberated platform. Brahma, Buddha, Prasanatma. The verse there in Bhagavad Gita, Brahma Bhutta Prasanatma, the one who's situated on the Brahma Bhutta platform, then he will engage in devotional service. So Brahma Bhutta is the platform of liberation. So it's not very significant. The devotee is not much concerned with liberation. Prabhupada quotes Bhuva Mangal Thakur how in his Krishna Karanamrita he described that uh, when he is engaged in the service of Krishna, then he sees liberation standing with arms folded, waiting to serve him. So that is the position of devotional service. That liberation is there any time for a devotee. And, and Dhruva Maharaj also said, Swamin kritartosmi varam He said, now I am fully satisfied. Fully satisfied because he had devotional service. So it's bhakti which we really want. Text number 12. Transcendental knowledge in relation with the Supreme Lord Hari is knowledge resulting in the complete suspension of the waves and whirlpools of the material modes. Such knowledge, self-satisfying due to its being free from material attachment and is trans being transcendental, it is approved by authorities. Who could fail to be attracted? Well, of course, we know many people do fail to be attracted. Many materialistic people are there. Okay, we're going to go ahead. Shona Karishi's eagerness for Krishna Kata. Here we can see artists' impression. Shona Karishi in the Naima Sharanya forest and all the sages eager to hear. All right, here's a quote from Srila Prabhupada. Would someone like to read? Similarly, Krishna has placed Goloka Vrindavan that is also spread everywhere. How that Goloka Vrindavan becomes spread? As soon as there is devotee? Yes. Tatra Tishtham. Narada Yatra Gayanti Man Bhakta. Krishna says, Naham Tishthami Vaikunthe Nacha Yoginam Hridayeshu. I do not stay in Vaikuntha Loka or within the heart of the yogis. Tatra Tishthami Narada Yatra Gayanti Madhaktaha. I stay there where my devotees are chanting about me, about my glories. This is the process. Immediately, Goloka Eva Niva Satya Akhilatma Bhutaha. Brahma Samhita 5.37. That is Krishna's power, omnipotency, omnipotency. Bombay, September 1973. All right. So. Srila Prabhupada is pointing out Krishna's home is Goloka Vrindavan. But he's everywhere. And especially where the devotee is chanting his holy name, then that is the very special place that attracts Krishna, where there's the pure chanting of the holy name. And Krishna likes to come there. All right, so 
uh, Dev, let me get this on the my book here. Thirteen. This. Okay, Sonika Uvacha. Text number thirteen begins. So Sonika said, "The son of Vyasadev, Srila Sukadeva Goswami, was a highly learned sage and was able to describe things in a poetic manner." What did Maharaj Parikshit again inquire from him after hearing all that he had said? So this is the first uh, inquiry from Shona Karishi. What He wants to know what did Maharaj Parikshit inquire after hearing from Shukadeva Goswami. So Prabhupada discusses the, about the qualities of a devotee how devotees will have all good qualities, and one of them is poetic. And we see, of course, wonderful poetry being written. Krishna, Krishna does Kaviraj, Kaviraj, and Vrindavan does Thakur, Chaitanya Bhagavat, the wonderful poetry describing the pastimes of the Lord. And Jayadeva Goswami also, Lord Chaitanya would relish hearing the poetry of Jayadeva Goswami. And Srila Prabhupada also wrote his arrival prayers and poetry about Krishna. Uh, when, the, uh, when Prabhupada was on the boat coming to New York, he wrote his prayer to Lord Krishna in a poetic manner. So. Poetry is one of the qualifications of a devotee. So, so to, uh, so Sona Karishi is speaking and he's in the Naimasharanya forest, so he's addressing Sutta Goswami. So text number 14, we read, O learned Sutta Goswami, please continue to explain such topics to us because we are eager to hear. Besides that, topics which result in the discussion of the Lord Hari should certainly be discussed in the assembly of devotees. Right? In Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna describes also, Machitamad Gataprana Bodayantas Parasparam Katayantas Chamam Nityam Tushyanti Cha Ramanti Cha. That the thoughts of my pure devotees dwell in me, their lives are surrendered unto me, and they derive great satisfaction and bliss by enlightening one another and conversing about, about me. So Prabhupada also talks here about how devotees like to discuss Ramayana and Mahabharata. These books are especially meant for the less intelligent class of people, the Striya, Sudra, Dvijabandhu. And of course from the Mahabharata we have the Bhagavad Gita and Bhagavad Gita is the primary knowledge. And Prabhupada talks, he said there some people say that Bhagavad Gita shouldn't be discussed by Grihastas. That is not but Prabhupada said that's stupid. He said, Arjuna is a Grihasta. Krishna spoke the Bhagavad Gita to Arjuna. If it wasn't for Grihastas, why would Krishna speak to Arjuna? So this is this nonsense argument is being dismissed by Srila Prabhupada. Um, okay, then coming up to text number 15, then we get the this point here which is brought up here in Prabhupada's quote. I first read text 15 to you and it's talking uh, Sonaka Rishi is speaking, remember, and he's addressing Sutta Goswami. He says, Maharaj Parikshit, 
the grandson of the Pandavas, was from his very childhood a great devotee of the Lord. Even while playing with dolls, he used to worship Lord Krishna by imitating the worship of the family deity. So in the purport there, Srila Prabhupada talks how that this is a sign of a Maha Bhagavat. That from his very childhood he was playing with the deity and worshipping the deity and imitating deity worship, although he was a small child. And Prabhupada says this is Maha Bhagavat. So here in this quote which we have on the slide, he's talking about the Mahabhagavats. Someone, you can read this. Hare Krishna. Such Mahabhagavatas are called Nitya Siddhas, or souls liberated from birth. But there are also others who may not be liberated from birth, but who develop a tendency of de tendency for de devotional service by association, and they are called Sadhana Siddhas. There is no difference between the two in the ultimate issue. And so the conclusion is that everyone can become a sadhana siddha, a devotee of the Lord, simply by the association with the pure devotees. Okay. So again, the association with the pure devotee is talked about. Uh, sadhana siddhas. We can, uh, we see the comparison how somebody is a Mahabhagavat, like Maharaj Parikshit is described from his birth, his very childhood. He was a great devotee of the Lord, playing with dolls, worshipping Krishna. So how does that compare to Sukadeva Goswami? If we compare Maharaj Parikshit with Sukadeva Goswami, is Sukadeva Goswami also a Mahabhagavan? Yes, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Why? Uh, because Sukadeva Goswami was uh, Krishna conscious uh, from the childhood, means not from the childhood, even uh, at the womb of his mother, and that's why uh, he was uh, he was not willing to come uh, as a child in this material world. And then uh, we see in the previous canto that uh, how after his birth he immediately uh, uh, went to the forest, and then he was leading a life uh, like a uh, liberated person. And then later on, he got attracted uh, by Srimad Bhagavatam and Lord's uh, different pastimes and beauty, and then came back uh, to hear Srimad Bhagavatam from his father, Vyasadeva. So he is completely a liberated person, uh, even from the womb of his mother. So he is a uh, Nitya Siddha and a Bhagavata. Okay, thank you. Yes, there, there are different opinions about Sukadeva Goswami. If he actually, if he actually came back, or some say he actually heard the Srimad Bhagavatam while he was in the womb. But we also know he was attracted to hear the glories of the Lord. That uh, that liberated persons are also attracted to the glories of the Lord. That is, of course, there from the Atmarama Sloka, that even ones on the platform of liberation, they want to glorify Krishna. So, Nidja Siddha and Sadhana Siddha. Let's read Prabhupada's quote. Oh, did we read it already? Yes. Yes, Maharaj. Right, okay, we read already. So, Nitya Siddha and Sadhana, what's the difference? Is there a difference? 
Prabhupada said, there is no difference between the two in the ultimate issue. Of course, there is a difference in the, in the beginning, because the sadhana siddha is one who becomes perfect, and nija siddha is one who is alre already perfect. By birth he's already perfect. Sometimes we give the example, uh, just like somebody is born a millionaire, someone's born, you know, in a very, very rich family, and he's, you know, he's He's a naturally, he's a millionaire. He's born in this very rich family. The father's a billionaire. So, you know, he's... And somebody else becomes a millionaire. He makes money. Maybe he's born in a poor family, but he works hard. He's very intelligent, very smart, and he makes a lot of money and becomes a millionaire. So they're both millionaires. One became a millionaire, and one was a millionaire by birth. You know, we say he's born with a... Silver, a gold, silver spoon in his mouth. So he has everything from birth. So someone else is sadhana siddhan. They, they achieved it by sadhana. They got there by their sadhana, by their spiritual practice. So ultimately there's no difference. Uh, Prabhupada is bringing up this point in the purport. He, he says, he talks about in the previous life, one may take birth from the, due to his previous life in yoga practice. He's given a chance, he takes birth in the home of a brahmana or a rich man or kshatriya kings. But Maharaj Parikshit was more than that because he had been a great devotee of the Lord since his previous birth. So from, since his previous birth he had already been a great devotee, but he's coming, he's taking his birth again. This time he's born in the royal family, in the family of the Pandavas. So he doesn't, does he get an actual chance to meet Krishna? Of course, Krishna had already, uh, had, was Krishna finished the pastime? No. Well, Krishna protected Parikshit when he was in the womb. Did he actually see Lord Krishna? We don't read about Parikshit actually meeting with Krishna, but we do know that the Lord protected him when he was in the womb of Uttara. But after he was, then he came out from the womb. Lord Krishna had gone to Dwarka. Lord Krishna goes to Dwarka and he finishes his pastimes, disappears. So I don't know that Maharaj Parikshit ever had the opportunity to personally meet with Lord Krishna. But certainly he knew about Lord Krishna. He knew about the connection between Lord Krishna and his own family. So the, because the Pandavas were all devotees, and certainly there would be deities in the family, and so he would see the worship of the deities and he would imitate. Just like Prabhupada told us how he would see his father worship the deity. As his father would come home every night, he would do his puja, he would do the puja of Radha Krishna and offer obeisances and Prabhupada would see his father. So when, Pra and when Prabhupada was a child also, he would play also with deities and he would also go to temple and he did, of course, his Rathiyatra, like that. So, from Prabhupada's life we see, you know, the birth in the Vaishnava family is very special. What does the Bhagavad Gita say? Who's born into a family of great transcendentalists? Sixth chapter of Bhagavad Gita. Yes, yes, Maharaj. Who? Sorry. Go ahead. Yes? Yes? Can you explain, please? Yeah, well, either you're born in a family of the aristocrat family or in a family of the great Vaishnava where he can continue his uh, spiritual practice. So what, what particular kind of yogi is born in a family of great Vaishnavas? 
those who could not perfect their uh, devotional service, they'll be banished birth. Well, there are two kinds of unsuccessful yogis. Right? There are two kinds of unsuccessful yogis described in the sixth chapter. What's the difference? Uh, one, one category who has done the yoga practice for a short time and one who has done for a long time. Yes. So one who has done, done those who are done for the long time, they will take birth in the pious family where they, they can take up the devotional service easily. Those who are done for a short time, they may be elevated to heavenly planets or a rich family. Right. Yeah. They go to they go to the higher planets first. And they satisfy their, sen their desires for sense gratification. Then they come back to earth and they take birth in the rich family. And those who were, who practice yoga for a longer time, but still not quite successful, they take birth in the family of great transcendentalists. And Prabhupada describes how he and his Guru Maharaj also, Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati, they both had that opportunity to be born into families of devotees, great devotees. Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati, of course, was the son, Simino son of Bhaktivinoda Thakur. Now, Bhaktivinoda Thakur, you read about his life, he wasn't born in so much of a, a very great devotee family. They were pious, but not so very great, you know. Not really, not that there were so much great devotees. But he became a great devotee, and then his son, particularly Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati, of course, Bhaktivinoda Thakur had several sons, but Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati was the most prominent of them. And Srila Prabhupada had sons also, but Prabhupada's sons, they didn't take a very active, they didn't really become active in Krishna consciousness. The youngest one, he's all right, you know, he's, he, of course, his name is Vrindavan, Vrindavan Das, Vrindavan Day, and he will sometimes associate with devotees. Actually, he had a daughter, Vrindavan who was Prabhupada's son, he had a daughter who became a devotee and she was the initiated disciple of Jayapataka Swami Maharaj and she was living here in Mayapur but, and she was married, she was a married woman with children but when there was a flood, when there was a flood somehow she drowned in the, in the flooding of Mayapur quite a few years ago. I remember that. Anyway, Vrindavan, and the, you know, so birth in a family is a great advantage if you have that opportunity. So Maharaj Parikshit, he had that advantage. And Prabhupada writes here that in the case of Maharaj Parikshit, that uh, Maharaj Parikshit was more than that. He was more than these uh, yogis because he had been a great devotee since his previous birth. It wasn't like he was some fallen yogi, he fell down to sense gratification or anything. No, he was a great devotee already, but he has come just to take part in the pastimes of Lord Krishna. So it's like that. Sometimes people who are very great in devotion, they will come, and before they go back to Godhead, they will come and take part in Lord Krishna's pastimes, and then go back to Godhead. Jiva Goswami actually says like that. He says that uh, before you go, you, you don't immediately go back to Godhead, but you go to wherever Lord Krishna's pastimes are taking place, and you take part in those pastimes, and then you go back to God. You get further training. So here we see Maharaj Pariksit. This is like his final training before he goes back to Godhead. Okay, so... Uh, Maharaj Pariksha is described and then uh, Prabhupada talks about his own family and how he was encouraged to worship and everything. Uh, 
nitya siddha and sadhana siddha, therefore comparing them, simply Prabhupada said, in the ultimate issue, no difference. We don't make who is a Nitya Siddha and who is a Sadhana Siddha. Certainly, it's a great fortune, somebody born in a pious devotee family. And Prabhupada was very anxious about the children who take birth in the family of devotees. He said, these are very, very special children when they come in the family. When a devotee couple have a child, we can consider that this child who's taking birth, that they must have been very spe they must have been already in the spiritual path in order to take birth in the family of devotees. So Prabhupada gave a lot of attention and he was always anxious for the children and to see that they were nourished in their spiritual life. Okay, so text 15 describes this sadhana siddha. Oh, a bit more. Someone please read. Nitya siddha and sadhana siddha. So nitya siddha means he does not get covered by the influence of material nature about his natural devotional tendency to serve Krishna. He never becomes covered. This is difference. Krishna gives him chance to get birth in such a family. So just like Maharaj Parikshit, that he never gets the chance of forgetting Krishna. So one who does not get the chance of forgetting Krishna is called Nitya Siddha. This is the difference. And Sadhana Siddha means one has forgotten Krishna. Srimad <laughs> Bhagavatam 2.3.15, LA 72. All right, so Srila Prabhupada is explaining to us here the difference between the sadhana siddha and the nitya siddha. That the nitya siddha, he, he, he never forgot Krishna. But sadhana siddha, we forgot, but somehow we get remembrance, we come back. So, he, but the nitya, nitya siddha, he never becomes covered. never forgets Krishna. So, so we want uh, we want to try to get that. Of course, there's one other type of perfection which is called Kripa Siddha, by mercy. Kripa Siddha. A devotee asked Prabhupada, what is Kripa Siddha? And Prabhupada said, he said, just like somebody comes up to you and gives you a million dollars. He said, does it happen? He said, somebody you never saw before, you didn't know them, they just walk up to you and they give you a million dollars. Did it ever happen to you? The devotee, of course, said, no problem, never happened to me. And Prabhupada said, yeah, it's very rare. He said, so like that, Kripa Siddha, it's very rare. They give you something very special, very valuable, but it's very rare. So Kripa Siddha, we cannot expect to get Kripa Siddha. We should endeavor for Sadhana Siddha. To become perfect, we should work for sadhana siddha. And at the same time, desire also mercy, if we can get the mercy. Just like honorary degree, kripa siddha is like honorary degree. Did you get honorary degree? Did anybody, any of our students here, were you given an honorary degree? No, I don't think so. Prabhupada gave the example, Rabindranath Tagore. He was invited by Oxford. Go to Oxford, they'll give you honorary degree. Now Rabindranath Tagore, he never studied at Oxford, but they, they asked him, come, we want to give you a degree. Be they appreciated so much his writing, his poetry and so on, so they brought him there and gave him an honorary degree. And sometimes people do get honorary degrees. If you, give, if you give a college or a university, if you give them a lot of money, you give them a big donation, they'll give you an honorary degree. <laughs> that's, that's the system today. You want to get honorary degree, give them enough money, they'll give you honorary degree. <laughs> okay. So our hope, our, uh, we have to endeavor for sadhana, do sadhana, and in this way we can also come to the perfect stage. 
Okay, then we want to compare also the life of, or, or, or the, the, the position of Maharaj Parikshit with Sukadeva Goswami. What do they have in common, Maharaj Parikshit and Sukadeva Goswami? What do they have in common? Both are great devotees of Krishna, both glorify. Okay, they're both devotees of Krishna. When did they both become devotees? Parikshit Maharaj, uh, he was a devotee right from his, the womb of his mother. And uh, Shukadeva Goswami, once he came out of the womb, I mean, earlier he was impersonalist. And then after he came out, then when he heard the Srimad Bhagavatam, then he became a, a personal, I mean, devotee of the God, in that sense. Both were devotees, but there's a slight transition uh, in the case of okay. Shukadeva Goswami. Both from their childhood, the devotees. Okay. Yes. Anything else in common? Okay. Uh, eagerness, uh, uh, yes. What? Eagerness. Eagerness to hear. Uh, that was the quality of parikshit and the eagerness to speak. That was the commonality uh, of parikshit Maharaj. Okay. Good. I mean, yes. Uh huh. The so, eagerness component, both of them, and the so, enthusiasm and eagerness. All right. So once a, once a speaker and once a hearer. So Kadeva Goswami is the master and Maharaj Pariksha is the disciple. Yes. Some more dif some more differences. What else is different between Sukadeva Goswami and Maharaj Pariksha? What's the difference between the two? Maharaj Parishad was an emperor. She owned everything in the world, practically. Whereas Shukadeva Goswami was a renunciant. She had nothing but himself except Shri Bhagavatam. Right. Sukadeva Goswami, how did he come dressed? He was not dressed. Yes. He was not, his body was not covered. He came naked. He was completely avadut, right? And Maharaj Parikshit, of course, he is the emperor coming from the royal order. So big difference. But by the grace of Krishna, they met at the appropriate time, just prior to the end of Maharaj Parikshit's life. Anything else? And, any other point? Yes? Maharaj Parikshit was a householder. Yes, Maharaj Parikshit was a householder. And Sukadev? He was not. He was a brahmachari, right. Mm -hmm. And Maharaj Parikshit, he'd heard about Krishna's pastimes at Vrindavan. Where did he hear about them from? When Parikshit Maharaj went around um, in his empire also, I mean, uh, uh, then before he meets Kali or even during that time, he hears about the wonderful dealings in the past times between uh, how the Lord was protecting his uh, grandparents throughout and the affectionate dealings of the Lord. So in that way, he knew about the Lord throughout. Yes, he would, he would hear about the Lord's pastimes from the elders in the family, from the elder people in the palace and so on because they all knew. But we could also say he was naturally inclined to Lord Krishna from his childhood. It may have been that he was just imitating what, what he was seeing the elders doing 
But the fact that he was doing these things as a child and that he continued this mood throughout his life indicates that he was a Mahabhagavat. And therefore at the time of death he was able to sit down and hear and fast and just simply hear from Sukadeva Goswami. So Prabhupada said everybody can become a sadhana siddha just by association, if we associate with the pure devotees. And who is the example? Who became a pure devotee? Narada Muni. Yes. Narada Muni. Right. Narada Muni is given that he is the unique, unique in the history of devotional service, that by association. And Sukadeva Goswami, he's the son of Vyasadeva. He's full in transcendental knowledge. He's also a great devotee of Krishna. So when the two meet, certainly there will be discussion of Lord Krishna. Okay, we'll go ahead. And then Prabhupada talks about his own life. We can read here, please. Someone read. In Nitya Siddha and Sadhana Siddha, a child naturally wants to play, so he can play with Krishna deity. We had the opportunity of doing that. My father was worshipping Krishna deity. So I wanted to imitate him, and he gave me small deity. That deity is still worshipped, my sister and myself. Whatever we were eating, we were offering exactly the same archana. This is the facility of taking birth in a Vaishnava family. Children, simply by playing with Krishna, they become Krishna conscious. Some way or other, if somebody comes in contact with Krishna, then his life becomes successful. So, this is Krishna Yoga, Bhakti Yoga, can be practiced even by a child without interfering with his natural propensities. Hare Krishna. Go ahead. And father used to encourage this Rathayatra and Radha Krishna temple, which we are propagating, it was from the very beginning of our life initiated by our parents. So anyone can initiate his child to this Krishna consciousness understanding from the very beginning. Srimad Bhagavatam 2, 3, 15, Los Angeles 72. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, and there's one purport Prabhupada writes that children from the age of 12, they can be initiated. And Prabhupada did initiate some children. When Prabhupada was here in Mayapur in Prabhupada's time, there's a few people, they were initiated when they were young children by Prabhupada. So Prabhupada gave them the chance. And, and they're still active in Krishna consciousness. So it's very great fortune that they can come to Krishna consciousness in childhood. I remember when I joined, I was 21 and I thought, well, I came so late. If only I had joined it earlier. <laughs> Later on, after I became devotee, people would ask me, when did you, what age were you when we became a devotee? And I said, 21. They said, oh, so early. I thought I was so late. <laughs> I thought it was late. And certainly good. Uh, Prahlad Maharaj says, Komar Acharet Pragno Dharmam Bhagavatam Kumar, from the age of five, we should begin to study Krishna consciousness. So that childhood, very important, very significant. So both Sukadev, and Gos Sukadev Goswami and Maharaj Parikshit, Prabhupada says, they're both on the same level. Although it appears that Maharaj Parikshit was a great king, accustomed to royal facilities, whereas Sukadeva Goswami was a typical renouncer of the world, so much so he did not even put a cloth on his body. Superficially, Maharaj Parikshit and Sukadeva Goswami might seem to be opposites, but basically, they were both unalloyed, pure devotees of the Lord. That's from text number 
six, 16 of the chapter purport. So certainly when they come together, there will be discussions of Krishna consciousness, bhakti yoga. So Sukadeva, then Prabhupada says, Sukadeva Goswami, Jiva Goswami says that both Sukadeva Goswami and Maharaj Parikshit were of the same category, settled long before. Although one was playing the part of the master and the other the disciple. But since Lord Krishna is the center of the topics, the words Vasudeva Parayana or devotee of Vasudeva suggest devotee of Lord Krishna, the common aim. Although there were many others who assembled at the place where Maharaj Parikshit was fasting, the natural conclusion is that there was no topic other than glorification of Krishna because the principal speaker was Sukadeva Goswami and the chief audience was Maharaj Parikshit. So Srimad Bhagavatam, as it was spoken and heard by two principal devotees of the Lord, is only for the glorification of the Supreme Lord, the personality of Godhead Sri Krishna. So they're both Nityasiddha devotees, they came together by the arrangement of Krishna and Thus we have the speaking of Srimad Bhagavatam. Okay, so Sukadeva Goswami uh, introduces the topic and the meeting of Maharaj Parikshit and Sukadeva Goswami and now he's going into, uh, after inquiring a little, he's offering this wonderful verse here describing the powers of hearing topics of Krishna is very important, right? This is also one of your, I think, must be memorization verse, right? Ayur harati vaipumsam ujjam astam chayana sao dasyarte yajjano nita uttama shloka vartaya So, Ayur, the duration of life, hariti, decreased. The duration of life is decreased by all people. When? Ujyam astam, the rising and setting of the asao, the sun. As the sun rises and sets, reduces the duration of life of all people. In the morning we may sit and we're anxious looking, when is the sun going to come up? Oh, it's cold. When will the sun come up? But we should, sun as a, we should understand as the sun rises, this is reducing the duration of our life. Except, of course, except for those who are engaged in hearing the topics of the Supreme Lord. So this is very nice. The topics of the Lord, Uttama Sloka Vartaya. If we are able to spend our time in, in that mood, just simply uh, hearing about Krishna, then we don't have to worry about the duration of life. We don't have to worry about dying untimely or any of these things. So this is a, a very powerful verse to give, describing the importance of uh, hearing about Krishna, how it can uh, keep us away from the miseries of material existence. So we want to always be engaged in this business of discussing topics of the all good personality of Godhead. We were discussing, I think yesterday, someone asked me, you know, how do you deal with someone if somebody is in the position, you know, they have a health problem or somebody became a devotee, they lost their job after becoming a devotee. And so with, when they lost their job, they thought, oh, Krishna's taken away my job or 
Krishna has done this to me or Krishna has done that to me. When a devotee appreciates these things, they become an impetus for our devotional service. Old age and disease, impending death, it's an impetus for our devotional service. If you look at the life of Srila Prabhupada, you can see in Prabhupada's life, when Prabhupada began the Krishna Consciousness Movement, and then at the end of the Krishna Consciousness Movement, it, it was like a marathon race. It was like a marathon. You know when you run a marathon race? You know at the end, you want to put in the final spurt. At the end, you want to really give everything you've got. And so Prabhupada was like that. It was like the final burst in, in the last year of his life, the last few years. They, they were like the final, the end of the marathon. It was a fine, great effort to do as much as he could to give everything to get this Krishna consciousness movement set up so that it would continue. But, he, you know, the, 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 the fear of death and the fear of disease and all these, these things, they're not a problem for the devotee. They're an impetus. We should understand that when the devotee has this problem, it's not karma. It's the arrangement of Krishna. He sees everything as the arrangement of Krishna. And Krishna gives him these things to help to prepare him for going back to Godhead for the eternal life. It's a preparation for the eternal life. So, this is a very important verse here. Sukadeva Goswami describing the power of hearing topics of Krishna. We want to always be hearing about Krishna. And that we, then we're safe. We had one devotee here in Mayapur actually. Uh, he gave class. He gave class in the morning. And then half an hour later he left the body. Amazing. He gave class in the morning and half an hour later he, was in, he had to go to the hospital and he had a heart problem and he left the body. Just after giving class in the morning. Oh, it's very special. Okay, so then some quotes here from Prabhupada. Someone like to read? The sun is rising early in the morning. As it is rising, gradually it is taking your life. That's all. That is the business. But if you want to defeat the sun, sun is very powerful. It is very difficult to fight. But you can fight with the sun. How? Simply by reading Krishna Katha, the words of Krishna. Uttama Shloka Vartaya. Vartaya Uttama Shloka Krishna. So, this is a simple process. You don't waste your time by talking nonsense. Go ahead, Maharaji. So, if we pass a point time simply by reading the reading and talking about Krishna, then the sun will not be able to take away our life. This is the secret. If you want to become immortal, then you always be engaged in Krishna Katha. Always 24 hours, always thinking of Krishna. This is Krishna Consciousness. June 12, 1972. Thank you. Okay, so very nice verse there by Srila Prabhupada. <laughs> okay, yeah. we have to go on to that. I mean, Let's go through the verses. We're at text number 18, right? Sukadeva Goswam and Shonaka. Shonaka is speaking uh, because 
we want to live, okay? You want, you want to live a long time? Because he was talking, you know, that the sun is rising and setting, decreasing our duration of life. So Sukadeva Goswami says in text 18, well, the trees also live. Do the trees not live? You want to live a long life? You want to live like a tree? Prabhupada said some trees there in Vrindavan, is, they say it's from Lord Krishna's time. They say it's 5,000, been there 5,000 years. And in Botanical Garden, there's a huge banyan tree, it's been there hundreds of years. And so, yeah, you want to live like a tree? That's not very good. Lord Chaitanya was here only how many years? And then? Lord Chaitanya, how many years did he pass in this world? 48 years. Yeah, and how many, what about Shankaracharya? How long was he? 32. Yeah. 32. Right. Yeah. And, but their contribution is so great. They didn't stay very long in the world, but they did great contribution. So the trees, they live a long time, but what do they contribute? You know, you want a, a long life like the trees? And you, you may say, oh, well, the trees, they don't breathe. So then Shonaka says, oh, well, the, the bellows or the blacksmith, they breathe, they breathe. You know, just because you breathe, doesn't, it's nothing special about that. The blacksmith bellows are also breathing air. What's the good of that? You may say, well, the bellows, they don't eat. So Shonaka said, well, the beasts eat, the beasts eat. They, they eat and they also discharge semen. So just eating and mating, the, the animals do that better than you humans. They do it more. They, do, they eat more and they can discharge more semen and have more ch children than humans. So Shonika Rishi, like this, he's, you know, he's really attacking the materialistic conception of life. That's text number 18, right? And then he goes on in 19. Let's read text 19. Oh, okay. Text 19 is this one. Uh, <laughs> this famous verse, right? The animalistic civilization. Here we have, right? Hogs, dogs, camels, and asses. Sometimes they translate it as donkeys, but Prabhupada is usually asses. The hog, the dog, the camel, and the ass. And so it's a very well known verse. What Swavid Varahostra Karai Samstusta Purushapashu. Right? The 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 translation uh, those men who are like dogs, hogs camels and asses, they praise men who never listen to the transcendental topics of Lord Krishna, the deliverer from evils. Sometimes Prabhupada would translate it, he would say, men who are like dogs, hogs, camels and asses praise other men of a similar nature. They praise bigger dogs, hogs, camels and asses because they never listened to the pastimes of Lord Krishna, the deliverer from evil. Uh, there's a very nice pastime where Prabhupada uh, spoke about this, this verse actually. Prabhupada was invited, I think it was in either in Mumbai or Calcutta, but Prabhupada was invited to a, one of those uh, Lions Clubs or maybe Rotarian something, that kind of thing. You know, all business people, wealthy people, and Prabhupada was giving lecture to them. And Prabhupada spoke on this materialistic civilization. And he analyzed the materialistic civilization to them. And he said, just like in material society, people are like dogs. The dog is described, he can get angry for no reason at all. And Prabhupada describes the dog, the dog mentality, he said, just like everyone, the student, when he graduates from university, you go and beg on the door, you knock on the door of the office, my dear sir, please give me a job, I will be a good dog for you. 
you know, the, the dogish mentality, you have to go and beg a job from someone. Every dog needs a master, so the dog, like that, you go and beg people. So this way Prabhupada compared human life to the dog. And the hog, the hog, he eats without any kinds of discrimination. So people who will eat anything and everything, they're just like hogs. And the camels, they're the ones who chew the thorns. They're, they're also a beast of burden and they chew thorns and they taste their own blood and think they're enjoying. So the same way people perform sinful activities and they think they're enjoying the results of their sinful acts, but actually they're chewing thorns. They will simply suffer. And then the ass, the ass is famous because he always gets kicked by the mate. When he tries to mate with the female ass, he will be kicked by her. And so materialistic life is described in this verse, in this way, that people who are like dogs, hogs, camels and asses, they will, they will Select men, they will worship people who are bigger dogs, hogs, camels and asses. These people will never listen to the pastimes of Lord Krishna. So this is materialistic society. Just like that. And certainly it's, it's so true when we look at the, if we look at the society as it is, the world as it is, we can see how how realistic, unfortunately, this analysis is. It's just like that. Hmm. All right, please read someone. Hare Krishna, one who has not listened to the messages of both the powers and marvelous acts of the personality of Godhead and has not sung or chanted loudly the Varthi songs about the Lord, is to be considered to possess ear holes like the holes of the snakes and a tongue like the tongue of a frog. The upper portion of the body, though crowned with a silk turban, is only a heavy burden if it is not bowed down before the personality of Godhead, who can award mukti freedom. And the hands, though decorated with glittering bangles and like those of a dead man, he is not engaged to the service of the personality of Godhead Hari. 2021. So I was telling Prabhupada lectured on this verse at Swavidvara Hostrakarai that he lectured on it in the Lions Club and you know he compared the society like this and the people, you know, Prabhupada was describing the hog, the dog, the camel, and, and the people were listening, they were laughing. And Prabhupada was so humorous, you know, they were, and the men were laughing and laughing. <laughs> and they were enjoying hearing Prabhupada speak, how he was describing the modern society, just to be hogs, dogs, camels, and asses. So after his lecture, they congratulated him. They said, Oh, Swamiji, you've spoken so very nicely. Thank you so much for coming and enlightening us and everything. And they were very happy with Prabhupada. So when Prabhupada was going away, and he returned with all the devotees, they went back to the temple. Then Prabhupada told the devotees, he said, he said, you see, I called them all hogs, dogs, camels and asses. And they have applauded me. <laughs> he said, they have applauded me. He said, I, I called them. What the, I, I, I explained to them that they are hogs, dogs, camels, and nasty. They have liked it. They've all clapped. They said, thank you, Swamiji. <laughs> he said, this is how you should preach. If you can preach like this, it would be very good. <laughs> so, Prabhupada... Uh, he captured, captivated the audience with his wonderful uh, speech and told them the message of Srimad Bhagavatam at the same time. And they liked it. They, you know, of course, the message was very deep. It maybe went over their head. It, they didn't realize he was talking about them, but actually he was. All right, so... Then Shonakarishi goes on 
to speak about other people who don't like to hear the topics of the Lord. And he talks about, uh, well, he said, first of all, they, they've not sung or chanted loudly the worthy songs about the Lord. That's a, an important point, right? We should chant loud, loudly. It's mentioned there. Chant loudly so that people can hear the glories of the Lord. And if they don't do that, then their, their ears are like the holes of a snake. The holes of a snake, just like the ears. If you don't fill them with, a, with the, the pure sound vibration, then the mundane sound vibration will enter. Something will enter the ears. If you don't fill the ears with the holy name and with the glories of Krishna, then the poison of materialistic life will enter. So the ears are described and then the tongue is also described. If we don't use the tongue to chant, then it's like the, the tongue is like the tongue of a frog. Right? When, the, when it starts raining, you can hear the frogs. Right? And the, the frog is chanting and the, the snake is coming. And the snake is coming, he's going to eat the frogs. The, that's the, the meal for the snake. So the chanting of the frog just simply brings the snake of death. So the ear and the tongue are described and then the head is described. You have a heavy burden on the head, you wear a turban, wearing a turban, it's very nice. People wear a silk turban, usually when people get married at that time they would like to put a turban on the man. In the past, in the old days, people would regularly wear turbans. And so turban is just a heavy burden if you don't bow before the Supreme Lord. If you're wearing a heavy, if you're wearing a turban on your head, it would just simply be a burden to the head. And you'll drown in the ocean of material life. So the 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 the, the head the, with the turban is is just a burden, and the hands you have beautiful, valuable gold bangles on. But if these hands are not used for the service of the Lord, then they're just like the hands of a dead person. Sonika Rishi says like that, just like the hands of a dead person. You're not using them for the service of the Lord. We'll read till the end of the chapter, all right? That's text number 21. So then 22 describes Mm -hmm. Eyes, the eyes which don't look at the Supreme Lord, they're like the, the eyes printed on the plumes of the peacock. If we don't look on the form and of the Lord, we don't see the deities, and the eyes are just as useless as the eyes on the plumes of a peacock. And if the legs are not used to go to the holy places and to go to the temple, then these legs are just like tree trunks. Useless. Then text 23 continues. We heard about the different limbs of the body. Now we're hearing about the importance of getting the dust of the feet of the pure devotee and placing it on our head. If we don't get the dust from the feet of the pure devotees, then our body is also like a dead body. And then again the tongue is mentioned, because the tongue is also used for tasting, or, oh no, it's the nose for smelling, right? The, we, should, we should be able to experience the aroma of the tulsi leaves from the lotus feet of the Lord. And if we don't have that experience, then we're also a dead body, even though we're breathing. So you see the different senses are all described as 
useless if they're not engaged in bhakti. We have to get the dust, take it on our head, we have to smell the tosi, the eyes, we have to see the form of the Lord, the legs move to the temple, the hands used for the service of the Lord, and the ears to hear about the glories of the Lord. And then text 24 is going to describe something very special. Because we've heard about the senses externally, now we're going to hear about the heart, the internal sense, right? So text 25, 24 says, Certainly that heart is still framed, which, in spite of one's chanting the holy name of the Lord with concentration, does not change even when one displays such signs of transformation as tears from the eyes and ecstatic standing of the hairs on end. Right? And we'll just finish the chapter. O Sutta Goswami, your words are pleasing to our minds. Please therefore explain this to us as it was spoken by the great devotee Sukadev Goswami was very expert in transcendental knowledge and who spoke to Maharaj Parikshit upon being asked. So, Shona Karishi is putting his final inquiry here. He said, tell us what was spoken. Just tell us, explain to us as it was spoken by Sukadeva Goswami. So we heard some inquiries earlier. That's other inquiry. Okay, going back a bit, going back, text number 20, someone read. There are hundreds and thousands of sources of distributing mundane news of the world, and people of the world are receiving it. Similarly, the people of the world should be taught to hear the transcendental topics of the Lord, and the devotees of the Lord must speak loudly so that they can hear. Srimad Bhagavatam 2.3.20. Okay, they have to speak loudly. So, Here's an exercise for you. How can you enhance appreciation of Prabhupada's mood and mission in your temple or community? Right? Going, remember, Prabhupada said here, the devotee of the Lord must speak loudly so that they can hear. The people of the world should be taught to hear, so that we have to speak loudly so that they can hear. So how are we going to do that to enhance appreciation of Prabhupada's mood and mission in your temple or community? Any suggestions? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. When, when Prabhupada said loudly, it means boldly. And without compromising on the principles uh, and uh, through book distribution. Well, look, we're talking about your temple or community. Uh, how we have to do within our temple community? That's what you mean, Maharaj? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so, so we, we, we know for the world we can go out on Harinam and do book distribution, but what about within your temple and with the community who are part of the, all part of the temple? Maybe you're living in a community, you know, a group of devotees. So how are we going to do it to enhance yeah. appreciation? Yeah, now currently what we do is, uh, because of, you know, the, of the kind of restrictions we have, to openly preach, now we do have a temple here. So we uh, group in small groups, like uh, in house. We have a lot of many house programs, which we call Bhakti Riksha. And that's how we inculcate people to come. And we conduct these Damodara Arti programs. And through children's class, we try to bring the parents also. And Damodara Arti is one of the super hit way of getting people here. And we had recent Kirtan Melas, in that way we try and uh, preach and bring people and we have in smaller groups and only for large programs we gather together. You do Damodar Arti even now after Kartik's finished? You're still doing it? 
No, just now we finished. Uh, okay, Recently, that, so that's but, only only one month you do Dhammadarati. You've still got 11 months. Yes. Um, Yes, someone else would like to take up? How are you going to do this in your temple or community? Enhance appreciation. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Uh, Maharaj, I think uh, reading Srila Prabhupada's book, more scrutinizing the devotees, and uh, in Prabhupada's, all the purport Prabhupada has given his mood and mission very clearly. So discussing about them, making it very clear in different discussion with the devotees and classes, I think that is uh, one of the important point. Hare Krishna. Okay. Yes. It's uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Important. Uh, having Hare Krishna Maharaj. Sorry. Uh, having regular programs, the Bhakti Uksha programs throughout the year, reading Bhagavatam and Srimad Bhagavat, uh, Bhagavad Gita, like how Mataji said, but we are doing it here regularly. And also, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, regularly indulging in Krishna Krishna's activities, that is, uh, conducting festivals throughout the year. Um, that's, all, that's it. Yeah, conducting festivals, yes, very important. We have a lot of Vaishnava festivals, right? So these festivals are very important to bring the community together and to strengthen the temple and encourage and enlivens everyone. Everyone gets enthusiastic when there's a festival. And Prabhupada said every day you can have a festival. <laughs> we also have really regular uh, and uh, focused study groups also, Maharaj wherein the devotees uh, wake up early in the morning and regularly they read in groups, uh, they read Srimad Bhagavatam and uh, the books of Srimad Prabhupada, Nidamrita, teachings of Lord Chaitanya, like that, they're all, all the devotees are engaged in regular study of the books of Srimad Prabhupada. Yes, very good, every day, very nice. And you know, just because there's pandemic lockdown, it, this is, an, this is a, a blessing for devotees. It's an opportunity to, for us to, to increase our sadhana and to strengthen our hearing and chanting and to bring the devotees in the community and in the temple more together. Maybe we cannot do the, the classes actually together, but at least we, with the help of technology, we have things like, you know, the Wi-Fi, so we can all be together like we are just now in different places, but we're all together. Somehow we're having this uh, discussion and communication. So we take advantage of these things to increase our hearing and chanting. And the more, the, the more there's the emphasis on hearing and chanting, we can see that devotees will become stronger. Uh, I remember when I joined the movement, we, we used to have several classes a day. There would be the class in the morning, and then we would go out for Sankirtan after breakfast, we'd go out for Sankirtan, we'd come back at lunchtime, and then we'd have a Krishna book reading after lunch, and then in the evening again there would be an evening program and be nectar of devotion and, and then so many classes were going on throughout the day. And so we didn't know anything, we didn't know very much, we were all very new devotees, but, but we enjoyed just being together and reading Prabhupada's book. We'd read the Krishna book and hear the pastimes of Krishna. It was, it was very nice. Of course in those days we were all living together in the ashram. Nowadays, it's, you know, we're more in congregation, but there's still the opportunity for hearing and chanting, making use of the technology. Certainly Prabhupada wanted it and Prabhupada would encourage it. So, yes, we want to improve hearing and chanting. Vaishnava festivals also very, very important. Even you cannot bring everybody to the temple, but still you can celebrate the festival. Maybe you have to do it online. And maybe they just come and collect a box from the temple. Some, devote, some temples did it like that. They just come and collect a box from the temple. Temple would prepare a box of prasadam. And they'd come and take their box and go home. 
They wouldn't eat in the temple. If there's a lockdown, of course, not so much, not everywhere is a lockdown. Some temples are quite liberal and everything going on. Okay, any other things? Some Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Uh, uh, our, in our congregation, Shamadesh, uh, uh, we all work in cooperation. We do not see uh, who are disciples of you. We all come together and our Siksha Gurus analyze our skills. Some may be good in Kirtan, some may be good in preaching, some of them may be good in cooking. So accordingly, they will try to improve us in whatever skills we have. We use it in the service of Krishna. So if they have good speaking skills, they are trained as a good preachers, or they may be trained for book distribution if they are good in marketing. So in that way, they all sit together, the Siksha Gurus guide us on what we have to do, and we thus improve our own selves in uh, service of Krishna. So. This is our spot. Okay. Of course, sometimes people are good at things, but they don't really like to do it. You know, they, they, you know, just like somebody may be a good cook, but they, you know, they get a bit tired of cooking and they want to do something else. So sometimes it's nice to be able to learn new things too. You know, you may not be very good at it, but if you have a good teacher, they, they can help you to improve. And like book distribution, Prabhupada wanted everyone to learn the art of book distribution. He thought, this is our family business. Book distribution is a family business, just like you have a family business, so everyone helps. So you should learn how to do it. Let everyone have the opportunity to take part in the activity. So we don't, we don't want people to feel tied up that, oh, you can only do this, no, no, you only do kirtan, no, you only cook. No. <laughs> no, it's nice to let people also learn other things too, to use their skills for Krishna. Okay. Yes, Maharaj, they, they help us to improve in what we lack. Oh. I forgot to add. They oh. help us to improve in what we lack and they use what we have. Okay. Where is this? Which temple? My Siksha Guru is Sachi Shodha Mataji. She is here in this class. No, but which day, dash was it? Shamadesh, Shamadesh, Shaja. Oh, oh Shamadesh, okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, very good. Very nice. Okay, any other things about this? Okay. Krishna, yes, Prabhu, go ahead. We call our devotees to our home for uh, prasadam. That will increase our love and affection among the devotees. It is one of the most important points required to grow as a community and also to improve the proper preaching. Okay, very nice, yes. Taking care, that's devotee care, bringing people to your home, be, having personal association with them. And sometimes, you know, we get a bit impersonal, we, we don't notice people, we don't care for them, so it's really nice that some people do that, that you bring people to your home and you can talk to them and get to know them better. Very good. Certainly it will strengthen the temple and the community. So caring and appreciating for each other. Also sometimes giving gifts. Prabhupada, would, when he would come back from his tour, he would like to give gifts to devotees. He'd bring a sari or he'd give a big bag or something, you know. And if you get something from Prabhupada, then certainly you would treasure it. So we do like to do things like that, to care for the devotees. Okay, we'll go ahead. Okay, here's a point. Someone like to read this one? Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Devotees are more merciful than Krishna. The conclusion is, therefore, that one should be more serious about seeking the mercy of the devotee than that of the Lord directly. And by once doing so, by the good will of the devotee, the natural attraction for the service of the Lord will be revived. Shrimad Bhagavatam 2.3.23. All right. So it's an important point to be noted here, that we should be more serious about getting the mercy of the devotee than that of the Lord directly. You know, how, how could we explain this, that the mercy of the devotee is more important to us than the mercy of Krishna? If 
devotees are the representative of Krishna. So the mercy, mercy flows through the devotees. Like Krishna is Karuna Sindhu, Vaishnava Sakrapa Sindhu. So they have the same quality and they uh, they transmit or they pass on that mercy of the Lord. That is the compassion of the devotee. Okay. Yes. Krishna Maharaj. Uh -huh. And uh, it is also mentioned that Krishna likes them who become the devotee of his devotee and who tries to become his direct devotee uh, for them his affection uh, can be considered as lesser than the devotee of his devotee so that's the one principle Correct. yes right yes yes, yes. one example from Chaitanya Chaitanya where King Pratap Rudra wanted to personally associate with Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was very strict that he would not meet uh, uh, kings or persons who are too much uh, having material uh, engagements. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu kept avoiding, but the devotees were trying to make all the arrangements for the king to meet him. And finally, when the king served the devotees, he was very inclined to serving the devotees and he made special arrangement for Ravananda Rai to be in association with Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu heard this, then finally he gave his own association also to King Pratap. Okay. Yeah, actually, uh, yes, Maharaj yes, Maharaji, go ahead. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. The devotees carry the Lord within their heart. So wherever they travel, when they speak, when they act, and when we hear, they are able to transform the same Lord within our heart too. They have the potency. So for that, we have to serve the devotees and hear from them attentively. Because they are the representatives who can give Krishna Bhakti to everybody. They are the only way of us reaching Krishna. So, okay. devotees are more important. I'll just read from Prabhupada's purport here. This is text number 23. He said, there's a common saying that one should first love the dog of the beloved before one shows any loving sentiment for the beloved. <laughs> Prabhupada, some quote that there's a saying, love me, love my dog, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so you, you want to love the person, you have to love the person's dog also. <laughs> so then Prabhupada continues, the stage of pure devotion is attained by sincerely serving a pure devotee of the Lord. The first condition of devotional service to the Lord is therefore to be a servant of a pure devotee. And this condition is fulfilled by the, the statement, reception of the dust of the lotus feet of a pure devotee who has also served another pure devotee. So then we, we say don't go to Krishna directly but go to Krishna through the devotee. And so we have to take, first take shelter of the devotee and then from the mercy of the devotee, then you can come to the parampara. All right, Prabhupada said, this is the way of the disciplic succession, the sampradaya. And then Prabhupada was asked, well, he quotes Maharaj Rahugana and Jadbarat and how Jadbarat was questioned by Maharaj Rahugana, where did you get this devotion from? And Maharaj Jadbarat says, the only way you get this devotion is by taking the dust from the feet of the devotee and smearing it all over your body. So the mercy of Krishna, to, get, to go direct to Krishna, that's very difficult. In Nectar of Devotion, Prabhupada explains that Krishna will not give his mercy very easily. Why? Because he'll come under their control. Yes, right. Yes, Krishna will come under the control of the pure devotee. If he, Krishna gives his mercy, he becomes controlled by his pure devotees. Krishna is Ajita, he's unconquered, but he's conquerable. He's conquered by the pure love of his devotees. His devotees control him. And so Krishna doesn't very readily give his 
full mercy. He was controlled by Arjuna. He became the chariot, chariot driver for Arjuna. And he delivered a message for Maharaj Yudhisthira. He became a messenger on behalf of Maharaj Yudhisthira. Krishna is always obliged to his pure devotees. So he does not easily give his mercy. But the pure devotees of Krishna, they are more merciful than Krishna. They give the mercy of Krishna because they understand the purpose of the Lord. So the pure devotees, they have to be approached. You have to get the mercy of the devotee. You can't go to, you cannot go to Krishna directly. Prabhupada continues, Lord Krishna is the property of his pure, unconditional devotees. And as such, only the devotees can deliver Krishna to another devotee. Krishna is never obtainable directly. Lord Chaitanya therefore designated himself as Gopi Bharto Parakamala or Das Das Anuda, the most obedient servant of the servants of the Lord who maintains the damsels of Braja. So a pure devotee never approaches the Lord directly but tries to please the servant of the Lord's servant. And thus the Lord becomes pleased. And only then can the devotee relish the taste of the tosi leaves stuck to his lotus feet. <laughs> okay. The, there's a very important point there coming up in that text number 23, that you have to get the mercy of the devotee. And then Prabhupada continues, he said, In Vrindavan, all the pure devotees pray for the mercy of Radha, Srimati Radharani. Srimati Radharani is a tender-hearted feminine counterpart of the Supreme Whole, resembling the perfectional stage of the worldly feminine nature. Therefore, the mercy of Radharani is available very readily to the sincere devotee. And once she recommends a devotee to Lord Krishna, the Lord at once accepts the devotee's admittance into his association. The conclusion is, therefore, that one should be more serious about seeking the mercy of the devotee than that of the Lord directly. And by one's doing so, by the goodwill of the devotee, the natural affection for the service of the Lord will be revived. Hare Krishna. All right, now this very important verse, text number 24. Certainly that heart is still framed, which in spite of one's chanting the holy name of the Lord with concentration, does not change when ecstasy takes place. Tears fill the eyes and the hairs stand on end. So we should, we may think that when we hear that, oh, ecstasy is taking place, tears fill the eyes, the hairs are standing on end, is that perfection? Not necessarily. Just because tears are in the eyes and the hairs are standing on end and ecstasy is there, it doesn't mean you're chanting the pure name. We have to see how much the heart has changed. So the important point here is the heart. If the heart is still framed, then you may chant. But even though you're chanting with ecstasy, there's no change in the heart. That is not good. You understand? The chanting, you're chanting the name with concentration, but there's no change in the heart, something is wrong. So, Prabhupada writes, oh, well, here, you can discuss here. Well, well let's read Prabhupada's quote first. Let me go back. The change in the heart. The mature stage of Vishnu worship is suggested herein in relation to the change of heart. The whole process of spiritual culture is aimed 
at changing the heart of the living being in the matter of his eternal relation with the Supreme Lord as subordinate servant, which is his eternal constitutional position. It is expected by all means that by discharging regulated devotional service, one must manifest a change of heart. Right? So, we want you to discuss in pairs. How many do we have today? Is it 24 again? Uh, 22 miles. Oh, 22. We're short today. Okay, too short. So that's one group short. So we have 11 pairs, right? So you can discuss. Have a partner and discuss to what extent have we experienced a change of heart as a result of studying Srimad Bhagavatam. So just give you three minutes. Okay. Everybody got a partner? No? No, Maharaj, I don't, I don't think I have got. So you can discuss with me, I'm here. <laughs> so have, you, have you experienced a change in heart, Prabhu? Yes, 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 yes Prabhu. Yes, Maharaj, sorry, I'm sorry. Yes? Uh, Maharaj, the first thing what I've experienced is after regularly attending Srimad Bhagavatam, first of all, we cannot miss Srimad Bhagavatam. That is one thing I have, you know, one class also if you miss, we, I feel that I am missing uh, something, you no, know, that particular week it will not go okay or something, you know, we always, the entire week I will be feeling as missing. And um, second thing, after uh, regularly attending this, studying, especially studying regular, uh, you know, regularly Srimad Bhagavatam, I am in the 10th canto now. But uh, that is from the beginning, I was reading from last uh, four or five years. But after reading that, we, you know, I, I get a, this one of what, who I am, what I am, what I, what I am supposed to do. And if I really, you know, if I want to do something um, which is uh, um, uh, like uh, not okay according to this, immediately that hit us, you know, we will not do anything wrong. We, uh, even if we want to do something uh, wrong, that will come to our mind. and. Uh, that, you know, consciously we will avoid all those things which are uh, not, uh, uh, which are inauspicious in or which is not good for cultivation of Krishna consciousness. This yeah. is one thing. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, um, also, um, uh, this, uh, you know, when uh, we are uh, reading Bhagavatam, that one thing which constantly Bhagavatam says is how to surrender to the devotees that is um, like that is the most important thing um, that is what we you know we always consciously we have to uh, serve the devotees uh, and then we should not do aparad to the devotees this is this is what automatically comes to us when we are uh, you know we we seriously when we seriously read bhagavatam study bhagavatam that is uh, association of devotees uh, no, uh, always we, we would like to be in association of devotees. That's what even Bhagavatam also emphasizes in uh, most all the chapters. No. So do you get an op a good opportunity to serve the devotees? How do you serve them? Yeah, because how means, uh, you know, uh, Maharaj, uh, we have regularly um, uh, cl uh, classes uh, here in uh, Shamades. Uh, like yesterday also we had a programs. So when we are going to the programs, uh, we, uh, the, uh, you know, what I do is I listen to the uh, our Shiksha Guru, whatever instructions he gives, we, uh, I do that one. That, that way it is indirectly serving the uh, Shiksha Guru. So following the instructions, Maharaj. Okay. Very nice. So you really feel the change in heart? Yes, Maharaj. That is automatically it has come. It's not that we are trying to do something externally. Mm -hmm. Automatically it happens. Yeah. These are external symptoms. Mm -hmm. Internally, 
Are you feeling yourself to be more tolerant and more peaceful and sense control? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah especially peaceful, as you said, Maharaj. Uh, uh, tolerance, I think, still I have to do so many things because still we get, I get angry, especially in the office and other things. Uh, even though sometimes after that, but one thing is there, Maharaj, after getting angry also, but immediately we will, I will come to know that, so what I have done is wrong. I repent actually. But the tolerance, yes, still I have to control. But peacefulness, yes, Maharaj, it is, it is, it is really I felt that I get the peacefulness. Yes. Yeah, tolerance or forbearance. Forbearance is one of the uh, important qualities which we have, want to develop more and more. You know, that we don't get easily disturbed. You know, we shouldn't be overly affected, overly disturbed by the material circumstances. Of oh, course, Prabhupada would also get, he would, he would simply say, do something about it. Recording in progress. Okay, everyone's back. All right, Manaji, you'd like to tell us? You're on the screen. Maybe you can tell us what, what you discussed. What's Manaji's name? I'm not sure. Uh, uh, Subangi Manaji. Subangi Manaji. You're on the Hare screen. Krishna, Maharaj. You're on my screen. Uh, Please tell oh, me Krishna. what you discussed. Uh, my uh, my partner was uh, Her Grace Gopi Priya Mataji. We were discussing how before reading Srimad Bhagavatam, we did not know how much of time we have wasted. We have wasted our time in gossiping. We have wasted our time in you know, uh, envious, hatred, all those qualities. Now, after reading Srimad Bhagavatam, we understand the importance of time. And we wanted to really relish Srimad Bhagavatam, which is given by Srila Prabhupada with so much of nectar in it. He doesn't allow us to deviate anywhere. The purpose are always focused on Krishna, his devotees, and how we should take our life. So whenever we have any issues, whenever we have any problems, we always refer to Srimad Bhagavatam. How, what is the solution that Srila Prabhupada gave? What is that the devotees did when at that time? Of course, we are not, I, I personally, I am not implementing it completely, but I wish to do it in future, Maharaj. Oh, very good. So this is what we were. So you're very time conscious now. Yes. Yes, Maharaj, to some extent, yes. Very good. Very nice. That's the quality of Baba. Right? You're up there. All right, Prabhus. Some of the Prabhus like to tell me something? Who would like Krishna to... Krishna Maharaj? Yes. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, myself and Murli Vadhan Prabhu has discussed in the group that, you know, after taking a Bhag uh, Srimad Bhagavatam, Bhakti Vaiba, Itself taking up Bhakti Baba, it itself you know uh, interested in uh, coming to Bhakti, and uh, after taking up the, the our uh, like interest in some mundane activity like reading newspaper or watching some some time that has been completely reduced, and we are trying to give completely on the Srimad Bhagavatam and Bhakti Baba course. So and also we are feeling that okay. The chanting is most important. Hearing and chanting the holy name of the Lord is most important. So, this is what we are experiencing, and we would like to give our time for this. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, good. Yes. Anybody else? Let me hear one more. Hey, Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Maharaji. Maharaj, my experience is, um, in fact, to read Srimad Bhagavatam, an association of devotees gives. Um, it's very enlightening and uh, it enriches your understanding and it is very relishable and we just don't want to miss the classes. So uh, it is very uh, nice, extremely nice Prabhuji. It's not a question of feeling nice, you feel more connected. Now we understand our purpose and uh, we feel, of course, like just now Shubhangi Mataji was saying, our concepts is clear and we want to implement it though it has to happen still more at a more faster pace. But we feel that we are in that path. We feel we can feel from ourselves what we were earlier and what we are into. And we just want to be with Srimad Bhagavatam. And um, it is, it is um, we understand who that father is, how compassionate he is. We are able to understand the wonderful qualities of Krishna and um, our earning to go back to him is becoming stronger by the day. Maybe it may take lifetimes 
but uh, we are sure of the process. What, what about if somebody says, well, you know, I don't go to class because, you know, he's giving class, I know everything he said, you know. I'm already a Bhakti Vaibhav graduate, so I already know this, I studied all this, I don't like to hear, I don't want to sit and hear it all again. Uh, Maharaj, we are actually not given the class, we all discuss, everyone reads and comes, and because each one has a different way of looking, so we all collectively discuss, it's not that, of course there are in some classes we do give a class because others are not near new, but most of the times it's a kind of a discussion that happens, and that is very relishable, oh, because yeah. each one has a realization. Yeah, very nice, that's good. Yeah. You know, someone may feel they, they've, they've heard the class before, okay, then come and ask questions, you know, at least hear what, what, what the person says and then you can, you can put some questions so that he can speak more. And the idea of discussing is very good. You know, sometimes devotees, they just read and then they don't discuss, but the whole point is after you read, then you have to discuss. Prabhupada said, uh, reading books is good, but more important than reading, is discussing together and explaining what you've read in your own words, you know, explaining what you've understood and just and discussing it with others. It's more important than just reading together. Some people may read, they learn nothing, they don't understand anything. So it's very important that we also discuss what we read and, and try to explain what we've read to others also. Yes, Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me see where are we? Okay. The change in heart. Of course, change in heart is really we want to go on and develop our bhava. <laughs> right? Come to the bhava stage. Okay, so what did we discuss today? We explained the connection between the second and the third chapter connection being that uh, Sukadeva Goswami wants, he, he's answered Maharaj Pariksit's question about what one should do at the time of death, but question came up, what if one has, still has material desires? You have, still have some material desires. So then he explained about worshipping different demigods and ultimately should worship the Supreme Lord. So that introduced the topic, the worship of the Supreme Lord. The overview of the third chapter. So after explaining about the demigods and then the importance of worshipping the Supreme Lord, then we hear Shonakarishi and his uh, attack on the materialists who never take part in devotional service and who don't care to uh, hear the glories of the Lord. And he also glorifies the process of hearing and chanting. We talked about the difference between Nitya Siddha and Sadhana Siddha, right? Would somebody like to tell us the difference? Nitya Siddhas do not forget the Lord. They are um, devotees right from the birth and um, there is no way they'll forget. And Sadhana Siddhas are the ones who come to that perfection um, by the mercy and association of devotees and actually they are because they had forgotten their uh, eternal position but they again they get revived to that position. Yes, thank you. Very nice. Very good. Okay, and then preaching application. Udharadi, the broader outlook. All should worship Krishna in relation to demigod worship and materialism in general. Right? So, certainly the worship of the demigods is condemned. Krishna doesn't encourage it at all in the Bhagavad Gita. But one who, people who are, have broader intelligence or broader outlook, they will worship the Lord even though they still have material desires. People may say, well, I'm not qualified, I still have material desire. But here, the Bhagavatam is very clear. No, you must worship the Supreme Lord. You should worship the Supreme Lord. Even you have material desires. And by worshipping the Supreme Lord, what will happen to our material desires? They get purified. Yes, yeah. 
we, they get purified. We actually lose the material. In the beginning, we come just like Dhruva Maharaj had so many material desires. But when he actually had perfected his sadhana and the Lord came to him, then he said, now I am fully satisfied. Now I don't want anything. And so that's the effect of worshipping Krishna, that it purifies us from all the material desires. And then how the sun fails to rob the pure devotees of the duration of life. How could we explain this? The sun fails to rob the pure devotees. Why? Because the heat of the sun. Hmm? Are you coming? Yes, one of you? I have. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Prabhu. Uh, actually, uh, as, as in the shloka, it has been discussed that when somebody is completely uh, imbibed in the, in, in the process of Krishna consciousness, uh, Krishna being eternal and all his uh, uh, paraphernalia being eternal, uh, it is an eternal activity and sun, which is destroying our temporary body, uh, cannot touch that activity. So our activity becomes eternal and thereby our uh, final goal becomes eternal. So we become beyond the purview of the sun. Okay. By hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord, we transcend the material nature. The sun is rising and setting, reducing the duration of life of the materialists. It's material, the sun rising and setting. Yes, it's material. But for the devotee, the devotee is not under the laws of karma. The one who is engaged in hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord is transcending the material nature. He is not influenced by the material energy. All right? And then, uh, Shastra Chaksus, the analogies. In this section, Sonika's analysis of one who neglects devotional practices. Text 17 to 28, right? What were some of the analogies given? The hogs and the dogs and the camels and the asses. Yes. Who are, who are, who, who are these hogs, dogs, camels and asses? Uh, the dogs are the ones who are... Uh, uh, like doggish mentality, they're just uh, uh, knocking for that bread and butter. Uh, they want to serve somebody who is superior, uh, not understanding that Krishna is a superior, superimposed, and he's the one who is providing. That is a doggish mentality, hawks, without any discrimination. They're just only behind sense gratification. So that's what it represents. And the hog and camels, uh, they don't even understand that they're suffering. They are um, showing the thorn. And they are relishing the blood, thinking that it is tasty, but not understanding they are suffering in this material world. And the um, asses are the ones who don't even know the kind of load they are carrying, and they go on and without understanding um, the real purpose of life. Mm -hmm. And how do they spend their time? What? Did, who do they elect for their leaders? Uh, the ones who are not. Um, it's the same. They are electing the dogs itself among them, amongst them, and they think that they are something uh, mm -hmm. supreme, and we have to serve them. Yeah, they, they will, have the same mentality. Yeah, they will elect the biggest dog or the biggest yeah. pig, <laughs> the biggest. fastest pig, or the <laughs> right. They'll elect them for their leader, and they'll praise them. Okay, so that's the animalistic society. That was one analogy. Can we hear some others? Uh, yes. yes. Yeah, please, please continue, Mataji. Yeah, you can each give one, give one analogy. Yeah, Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Uh, in 18th uh, verse, it is uh, it is said that uh, uh, materialistic men live like trees. They they are not uh, for any purpose. They do not serve any purpose. If one says the trees do not breathe, then uh, Shukadeva Goswami gives the analogy of the bellows of the uh, blacksmith that breathes, but is there any purpose? Breathing is not a symptom of life. And if one says the trees do not eat, but we eat, in that case, even beasts, they eat 
and discharge semen and create progeny much more higher uh, and faster than us. So what is the use of living for a longer time if you are not serving Lord Krishna, if you are not chanting and hearing the glories of Lord Krishna? This is the analogy, uh, Maharaj. Okay, very good. Yes. Yes, next one. And also he talks about the different limbs of the body if it is not used. Yes. Like he said, in like the ear holes, the ears, it's, like, it's simply like the snakes. Yes. Uh, then he talks about the tongue, like the frog. Yes. Then only it is croaking and inviting death. Mm -hmm. He tells that part and then... Um, the eyes? I what? think it all, eyes, it, it's like the plumes of the, uh, of the peacock. Yes, right, good. And yes, the, the head? Uh, it's just like a, a turban, uh, a silken turban which doesn't have any, uh, unless it goes, the head is, is going to the Lord, then there is no purpose of that, um, I mean, no, it doesn't have any value. Right. You're... Then he says the heart is steel framed, if it does not, uh, there is no change of heart, it's okay. like steel framed. Okay. All right, very good. So then we discussed also Srimad Bhagavatam's description of society in terms of the hogs, dogs, camels and asses. Yeah, we just heard that. And then also the statement, be more serious about seeking the mercy of the devotee than that of the Lord directly. And so we, we talked about that quite a bit. The very important point that we need to get the mercy of the devotees to get the mercy of Krishna. To go to Krishna without an introduction is not very good. Krishna will say, who sent you here? Who is recommending you? Yeah, there has to be the mercy of the devotees. So it's very important we approach Krishna's devotees. And then we've discussed also the change of heart can actually happen in our lives. The change of heart can happen in our lives. The change of heart. How? Just simply by our intense desire to achieve it. We have to desire to want to go back to Krishna, to be with Krishna, to focus our mind more on Krishna. And, and the more we desire that love, loving relationship with Krishna, the more we'll get that change of heart and we will feel the genuine longing to be with Krishna. And then mood and mission, the, the statement about people of the world should be taught to hear the transcendental topics of the Lord and the devotee of the Lord and they must speak loudly so that they can hear. So we talked about how we could do it loudly, how we could loudly propagate this message of Krishna, even among our own devotees in our congregation. Okay, very good. So, thank you very much. Any questions before we close? Anyone? Maharaj. Yes, Prabhu. Uh, Maharaj, uh, this, uh, just had this one uh, thought in the mind, that uh, Srimad Bhagavatam, it is said that it talks about pure devotional service and uh, in the first itself it says that all other cheating religion have been removed and uh, here also in this particular chapter it concludes that whether you have desire or not desire, you should worship the Supreme Lord. Then why at all this particular uh, verses where those who have different desires should worship different demigods, why this section is there or it is mentioned? Well, just to show that, that that is there, that people may have material desires, but these people ultimately they're condemned, you know? Just like Sukadeva Goswami, he, present, he presents many things in the course of the Srimad Bhagavatam. We heard about the worship on the universal form, and we heard about the Astanga Yoga, and, and, and you know, these different, approaching all these different things. Panchapasami almost like that was almost recommended. The Astanga Yogis, how they go back to Godhead. The Jnanis, how they go. It's mentioned there. It doesn't mean that Sukadeva Goswami is recommending it, but we look at what comes after this recommendation. Then he says, 
He said, the one who is actually broader intelligence, he will worship the Supreme Lord. In other words, he's saying the less intelligent people will worship these demigods. And so Sukadeva Goswami knows there are people worshipping these kind of demigods. All this worship, worship is going on. So Sukadeva Goswami wants to just expose it and say, ultimately, these people are all foolish, less intelligent. And they do it. And they do it. And look at the things, he, you know, so many things, so many material things he mentioned. Mm. Oh, so people may be thinking, oh, this is very nice. Oh, yeah, I want that. Oh, I want this. And I want to be... <laughs> I want long life, I want, I want wealth, I want a beautiful wife, I want a happy family, I want all these things. But this is not intelligent. What is intelligent? You worship the Supreme Lord. Even you want all these things. You, okay, worship the Supreme Lord and you'll get the purification. So it's mentioned there just to open it up, to expose it, that this goes on. People do these things. Thank you, Maharaj. Yeah, Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Yes, Prabhu, go ahead. It's just a thought when we were talking about Nitya Siddha and Sadhana uh, Siddha. So, so, can we say just for a moment, uh, Sukhadeva Goswami also forgotten about the Lord? And then he realized for a moment when he was born? So, can we say that momentarily or just temporarily he just... But we say he, he was fixed on the platform of Brahman. Like that's why he remained within the womb for so many years, 16 years before taking birth. That he was fixed on the platform of impersonal Brahman. And it, I think it, it says somewhere that Lord Krishna personally comes and, and, and tells him, look, you can come out, you don't have to be afraid that you'll be, you won't fall down, you're not going to be influenced by the material energy. You don't have to remain there, you can come out of the womb. So okay. he... So someone who is at an impersonalist level also, Maharaj, we can uh, treat them as a Nitya Siddhas, because they're still concentrating on some portion of the Lord. Mm, yeah, they may be Nitya Siddha, you know, uh, they, they, well, Nitya Siddha, remember, Nitya Siddhas are very special, means from birth that they are actually attracted like this and absorbed in the transcendental topics of the Lord. To be a Nitya Siddha, they have to be very great personalities. Usually the impersonalists, their goal is to go into the Brahman, right? Yes, yes. So, so are they going to take, uh, you know, if they take, if from their childhood they're drawn to the impersonalist path, uh, sit and meditate? Mm. Nitya Siddha. Yeah, so when he was born, he was meditating on the old car, and then he was made realized, and that's how. So that's what I thought was. So we don't think of Sukadeva Goswami ever really forgetting the Lord, but he was fixed on the transcendental platform, and from the actually, it's it's more as an example. He was used as an example by the Lord to show the power of hearing topics of Krishna. That even though he is actually on that platform, uh, playing the part of the impersonalist, that he heard the topics of Krishna and became a devotee. So it's to give the example of how, by hearing topics of Krishna, even the mind of the impersonalist can be changed and can be brought into devotional service. Not particularly that Sukadeva Goswami was really the impersonalist, or in his last life he was impersonalist, but he's playing that, taking that position of the impersonalist for the pastime, for the purpose of showing all of us the power of hearing topics of Krishna. Understood, Maharaj. Thank you so much. Hare Krishna.
Yes. Okay, so we'll meet next week. Thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada Ki. Go back to Vrinda Ki. Oh, no, no, not a government. <laughs>